afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this new disruptive patterns talk. Um, today, we have the pleasure to welcome Francesca Tower with us. Hello, Francesca. Hello, wow. hello. Hello from London. Um, I'll give you just a quick introduction and then I'll pass the mic to, to Francesca. So, um, as you may already know, Francesca Tabra has more than 15 years of experience at the intersection of emerging technologies, business strategy, and credit industries. And among the many things, she has also been featured as a speaker at events like a Global Tech Summit, the AI World Fair, Data Summit. By you know, as I was saying, Francesca has been a speaker at events such as a global sport tech summit, digital fashion week, I would fair that summit, and then I leave uh, the rest to Francesca because it's a very long and super interesting list of events. And what she's gonna, um, let's say, present us today, well. She will delve into the journey, um, her journey as an AI educator and innovator, and also providing some clarity and shedding the light on how she assists organizations in unlocking the transformative potential of artificial intelligence um, to address problems and conceptualize the future possibilities. And so it sounds already super interesting. So I would say that I will pass the mic immediately to, to you, Francesca, and enjoy the, um, the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, sono... Mezza Italiana, but I don't uh, speak very well, unfortunately, but hopefully I can improve. Uh, that will be one of my aims this year. Uh, so I am a very creative person. Um, at the beginning of my career, I was working in technology, so building technology. Um, I was project managing teams, building apps like, like a Facebook, um, and then slowly but surely have moved also within technology, but in the marketing sphere. So organizing lots of events, workshops, um, and, and teaching. And I really enjoy sort of giving back and helping people on their journeys um, into this space. So, um, and you can check out my, my details, my projects. I've got a number of communities, including, I think my biggest one is Fashion AI, where I've got 23,000 people um, in that community who take part in regular AI uh, design contests. Um, but I, I'm interested in all sorts of different um, facets of uh, creativity. So architecture, gaming, music, um, and film, all of which are being disrupted by AI. So I will share my screen. So today I aim to give you a, an overview of how uh, the creative industries are being disrupted um, by artificial intelligence. And when I'm talking about artificial intelligence, I'm talking specifically about generative AI. Um, so generative AI effectively uses a lot of data to train an AI model, and then it can create more images, text, video, music, et cetera. So it's generative. It, it is a creative form of artificial intelligence. So let's start at the, the beginning. So we've had so much, so much innovation over the, the last couple of decades. Um, and um, I can go into this in more detail, but I won't bore you with the, the details of all of the AI advancements. Uh, but essentially, uh, AI is intelligent. It, it is comparative to our own human intelligence. Um, and so when um, machine uh, and data scientists were building this AI technology, they were looking at the brain and seeing how can we get uh, technology to um, be as intelligent and think and act like humans. Um, and in some ways not think and act like humans, think, think and act more rationally without all of the emotion, without all of our biases and some of our weaknesses. Um, and it's been really surprising, I think, for a number of people to see that AI is really disrupting the creative industries. Everyone thought that it was going to first remove all of the repetitive tasks, the uh, mundane tasks, the sort of tasks that people have to do in a factory. But actually what's happened is, is we've seen a huge creative potential um, in artificial intelligence. So what you can do now is you can input text, voice, image, and you can output any form of output that you want, whether it's um, you know, images or 3D to create games or to help with uh, film production or audio and even interfaces. So you can literally sketch 
on a napkin, uh, wireframes for a website, take a picture of it, computer vision will understand what's in that image and then we'll render that into HTML and CSS. So really speeding up the process of the creative process of creating a website or an app. Um, and here is an example. Undoubtedly, the biggest global event that occurred in 2020 was the COVID-19 pandemic. It has affected millions of people worldwide and brought about significant changes in the way we live, work, and interact with one another. So this is an example of what people call conversational AI. So we're having a conversation with artificial intelligence. It's giving us an answer back. At the moment, lots of people are using ChatGBT. They write something, they get a written response back. But as you can see, when you start to add voice to it, it, it you, you start to humanize the technology. You start to relate with it more and more. This is just voice, but you can imagine when you have avatars which move beyond uncanny valley where you can tell that it's an avatar to being something really um, realistic with human emotion um, and responding to you. Here, uh, here we can see basically the adoption of ChatGBT um, and the result of which has been uh, the whole stock market has has been shaken because of this. Um, so moving away from from Alphabet um, to uh, so Google in, in this case and um, towards Microsoft, but of course Google are coming out with Google Bard um, and all of these massive tech players who have access to lots of data um, and talent, of course, are releasing their own AI models and their own um, tools to the market. Um, and Facebook, Meta Facebook, are a huge player in the space. They have all of our images from, um, you know, having uploaded that and commented on the platforms. Um, so as consumers, we also have to really start to be wary about what information we're putting on which platforms, check the change in privacy as they start to use this data, um, and, and be very careful about what you're opting into and opting out of um, to ensure that you are still remaining to protect your, your own intellectual property, especially as a creative person. If you've got images on Dribbble or Discord or um, any number of these creative sites, keep a close eye on the privacy terms and conditions so you can make sure that uh, you know what's happening as you upload images into the, onto the internet. Um, this is basically showing that in the last year, the number of AI images that was creating it in just one year. So um, Shutterstock essentially licensed out their images to these AI and machine learning um, models to train them. Um, and then of course we have the release of Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey, and we've just had this cr crazy explosion of AI images. Um, and essentially, we've created more than the whole of Shutterstock in its entirety, including all of its vectors, all of the 3D assets. We've exceeded that in the past year. Um, so really quite astounding. And obviously, when you have an explosion of, um, of new items into the market, it also reduces the value of those images. Um, but the output of those AI models is going to, only going to be as good as the input data. So it needs really good photography. It needs really good artwork in order to have a good output in the first place. And as we interact with these tools, we continue to refine them as we choose which images we like, which images we don't like. We are consistently training these tools to create the output that we want. So you, if you've used Midjourney, you might have seen the movement from kind of game art to very, very photorealistic images that you could see in Vogue, let's say. And just to say that right now in this period um, of, of history, this is the worst that AI is ever going to be. So if you're already impressed by AI, you know, in just a couple of months time, we will really start to see uh, the full potential um, of AI and it will come up with all sorts of 
beyond being creative, it will also come up with inventions and discoveries um, of things that we still don't understand today. We still don't really understand the pyramids. We don't really understand uh, the depths of space, the depths of our seas, um, you know, certain languages that were left by previous civilizations. So AI can really start to decode some of these mysteries for us. So it, it's a very exciting time. Um, and let's now look at some of the ways that AI can um, affect you. So AI can be used for storytelling. Um, ChatGPT is a great tool for, for copywriting. You might have used it for creating uh, social media posts uh, or white papers or blogs. Some people even write books with it these days. Um, there are tools where you can compare the output between these different large language models. So here we've got ChatGPT, Claude, Falcon, um, Llama 2 and Bing. Um, Bing, I believe, pulls also from the internet. So it's more kind of real time. If you're trying to get analysis on uh, what's happening in the news, let's say, uh, Bing will be a really good um, tool for you. But it's really good to test these different uh, large language models to see what fits for what um, specific purpose. So moving into the storytelling element. So if you are a screenwriter, you can write a prompt such as write a 40 word uh, video script for a software called Swift Journal um, that helps unorganized traders improve their performance with real time data recording and then ask them to sign up for SwiftJournal.io. And what you can see here is in the prompt, this is you can break it down into to um, the instructions. So there's the call to action, there's a pain point, there's a unique selling point. So that's, you know, storytelling for, say, an ad. Um, but if we're tell telling stories for, let's say, a film, we can also um, explain various different characters, the setting, um, and the overall story arc of this hero's journey. So a lot of um, films and movies follow the, the hero's journey. Um, and then you can ask ChatGBT to put this in a format of a table so that's all nicely organized with the, the scenes, the actions, the script, um, and maybe a sketch or an image. Once you have that, you can then use um, tools like Midjourney to start to create um, these images. And you can create it in any specific animation style you want. All of these images were created with AI. These aren't originals. After that, you can then um, start to animate those images with tools like Runway, Pika Labs, um, and overlay that script that we talked about with say, you know, Eleven Labs, um, which basically takes your text and turns it into audio. In the heart of war-torn Europe, the city of lights remains a beacon of hope and joy, bustling with life and laughter. Behind the city's cheerful facade, a group of brave souls plot in shadows, forging a daring plan to fight back. Colonel Lando and his associates secretly convene on the Seine River. Under the guise of leisure, they craft a menacing plot hidden in plain sight. As night descends, the bastards move through Paris. Their aim to boldly disrupt the sinister forces shaping the city's fate. In the Grand Theatre, amid the spectacle, the bastard's surprise move looms. As evil watches, unaware, a pivotal twist awaits. Inglorious Bastards, an AI film. And then what we've also seen is uh, the rise of a sort of meme culture, moving away from just an image with some funny text and these jokes um, to fully fledged um, trailers, which will maybe merge two different films at the same time and, and make a sort of parody of it. So here we've got Barbie and Oppenheimer, um, two big blockbuster movies that came out at the same time. Um, uh, and we've got this new version. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a race against the Nazis. And I know what it means if the Nazis have the bomb. She's a scientist, and I hear she's the best. Good. She's also a doctor. Excellent. She's also a flight attendant, astronaut, Marine Corps medic, paleontologist, veterinarian, and three-time Olympic gold medalist.
I see the bright pink glow of a new era. We imagine a future. And our imaginings look fabulous. Barty, together we're going to beat those Nazis. And we're going to look so good doing it. Um, and then we have Star Wars in the style of Wes Anderson. In a galaxy far, far away, prepare for a reboot like never before. This summer, Wes Anderson brings you a side of the Star Wars universe you've never seen before, the Galactic Menagerie. Join this ragtag crew of unlikely heroes as they navigate the absurdity of the cosmos, challenge the Empire, and redefine what it means to be a rebel. Our mission is simple. We steal the Emperor's artifact, save the galaxy, and maybe find ourselves along the way. For this... Um, and we also see big brands moving into this space. So this is um, an ad by Coca-Cola where they're using style transfer, which is one of the key techniques with AI, where you basically take a style, say um, style of Monet, and you can apply it to any portrait uh, or any image or any um, video. Um, so they're really um, playing with this, the theme of style transfer in this ad. Um, so they have it for, for the storytelling elements. Um, in terms of building worlds, um, creatives can build worlds in the metaverse and in games um, through building these environments. However, you can also build worlds um, in the real world uh, through architecture, interior design, and visual merchandising. Um, so here are some concept stores that were realized through generative AI. So we've got I think this was a, a Gucci uh, tree house uh, sort of concept. Um, we've got sort of a kaleidoscope um, concept in the desert over here. Um, Rick Owens um, on Mars. So really taking basically um, designing sets for films and bringing this into the retail environment to create these concepts um, and worlds. Balenciaga Ice Store a Dior Aquarium, uh, here, here we go, the, the Gucci Treehouse. Um, but more than building worlds, one of the main use cases for AI in the creative workflow is for creating new products and packaging. Um, so here, what we can see on the right is um, style transfer and in painting. So basically taking a sketch and within that sketch, um, turning that into uh, a design. And this is obviously really effective for um, the fashion industry. Next, we have uh, combining two different styles together. So the garment shape and the pattern, um, and you can use data to analyze and use computer vision to analyze um, 
what people are posting about on social media to understand real time trends um, or to look at um, celebrities and what they're wearing or to see references from movies, uh, because all of these uh, are, are sort of cultural triggers um, that are going to be uh, pushing these trends. And as a fashion brand, especially if you're in the, the fast fashion space, you'll have to respond to this really, uh, really quickly. And there are so many data points all over the internet that this is really where um, creatives and um, technologists and data people start to work together to create uh, designs that people really want rather than just uh, as a, a way of expressing the creative's um, you know, identity. So responding instead to the consumer and what they want. Um, and once you have these images, again, you can animate them. And what I really love about this digital fashion show is you can see how soft um, the fabric is and how it's moving, how uh, their reflective elements, uh, their hair's moving, the way they're, mo they're walking is, is fairly natural. Um, and this is going to improve so much over the, the next, the course of the year. And this is another example of a digital fashion show which uses pose estimation. Um, so pose estimation essentially looks at the shape of your body and how it basically creates a stick man. Um, and as the model is walking, um, you can then assign the, the fashion to the body um, so it's accurately overlaid. And then you can create these um, sort of animations where they're um, the model is changing, the fashion is changing, um, and it's quite a fun concept. This will also lead on to virtual try-ons. Still to this day, virtual try-ons aren't the best. If you use filters, for example, um, you can already see some virtual try-ons because all filters are effectively um, that. Um, so it's identifying in your face, your eyes, your nose, your ears, so it can place various different stickers and um, accessories on you or makeup or change your hair color. So in terms of pose estimation for your face and understanding all of your different markers on your face, it works really well. But for the body, it's not quite there yet. Um, often you'll have a leg that sort of comes out of, of you know, trousers or, or dress at this stage. Um, but eventually, again, we'll be able to use data so you can um, have a video where a model is wearing a specific outfit, um, or you can have like hundreds of different videos wearing different outfits, and you can then see uh, based on the data what people are clicking on, what they like the most, um, and start to use data to to drive those um, manufacturing so that we can also make the fashion um, supply chain more sustainable. One company that does this a lot is called Sheen. Um, and it creates hundreds of thousands of different products. Obviously, they're, they're all, you know, made in, I don't know, in, in maybe uh, in Vietnam and in China and, and these sorts of places are made at quite low cost. Um, however, a really, really important part of AI is human oversight. We still need people to watch over um, and do quality control and curate what is being created by the AI, because even if something is popular, it might not be politically correct. So we've, this is an example of a metal swastika that was put on um, the website, got lots of complaints, got taken down. Um, there are other examples of uh, prayer mats being um, created and mixing, you know, uh, Islam with another culture, which also created a bit of an uproar. So cultural sensitivity um, and also localizing different products for different um, geographies and demographics is going to be really important. And that's really where marketeers come in. Marketeers' job really is to understand the customer, uh, understand the different personas uh, and who they are and to target them with, with exactly what they want at the right time. Um, if you are in um, the food and drink industry, you can obviously create some incredible um, new recipes. I really want to try this out because I've got a, a pet who hates pet food uh, called Tiago. He's a sausage dog. Um, and I'd quite like to take a picture of him and, and create some, um, you know, gourmet dog food just for a bit of fun. Um, 
in China, they have experimented with this to create new exotic uh, flavors of ice cream. Um, and then you can move on to the packaging side, creating uh, novel concepts. Here we've got a transparent Doritos packaging. Um, we've got some more a packaging for snacks. Um, and then we've got a concept of sustainable packaging for McDonald's. So you can take a fast food brand and completely change the brand. Uh, this is just looking at the packaging, but you can imagine what you could also do uh, looking at visual merchandising to the actual store to really communicate that McDonald's is taking a turn and that they are now a sustainable business, which would be a, a lovely uh, output. Um, what I've certainly seen um, on social media are a lot of fake brand collabs. At the moment, you know, people will put a disclaimer saying that they're not working with the brands, but what you can see is it's it's quite fun, it's quite effective, and it's certainly these sorts of posts do go viral. Um, and it might actually encourage these brands to start working together. So here are some examples. <laughs> Um, and what was really interesting with, let's see that, let's see if I can, yes, the British Airways and Burberry one. Um, so Eric Groza created this uh, fake brand collab. He used stable diffusion. So he first trained his own AI model with lots of images um, and then automated the process of creating as many of these images as possible, selected the ones that he liked, retrained it and, and went through this sort of iterative process until he um, had the images that he liked the most. Of course, there will be faults. Um, but it gives a really good concept. What he then did is he went into ChatGBT and asked ChatGBT, why would a collaboration between British Airways and Burberry make sense? And it actually, it, it talked about uh, the Chinese market who they like to fly to England. They really love heritage brands. And this would be the perfect brand collaboration for a specific flight. So you can see how these tools then start to work together um, to give you a really good sort of creative output. You could then go one step further and ask ChatGBT to look at the financials of a brand collaboration like that, or to act like a CFO, um, or to help um, write the contracts for this brand collaboration. Um, and, and very soon you move from just a concept and a pie in the sky idea to something a lot more concrete that actually could be realized. Um, brand licensing is a huge space. So a lot of creatives, they want to create their own brand, their own identity. They want to be known, um, but it's a crowded market. There are a lot of existing brands um, that have attention, existing artists. Um, and so we're all com competing for eyeballs. So one way to be creative, but without having to start a brand or, you know, be that standout artist is to work with already existing ones through brand licensing. And there's a huge opportunity to take an artist's work and to transfer it to a different form. So in this case, this is Yayo Kusuma, who um, already does a lot of brand licensing with fashion brands, um, museum exhibits. And I wanted to show with this um, how her artwork could translate to a high-end fashion brand. And here we can also see what this would then look like for a pop-up store. I, of course, tried to get in touch with Yayo Kusuma, but unfortunately she, um, she is in a psychiatric ward, so I wasn't able to uh, contact her and, and make this happen. But if anyone's got any contact with Yayo Kusuma, please get in touch. Um, so the main thing here is just realizing how easy it is to create these creative concepts and producing digital products will, the cost of doing that will really um, start to diminish. So it becomes easier and easier, faster and faster to create these products. And eventually AI will be able to create, you know, more or less 
anything from movies to books uh, to financial market predictions to medical diagnoses and drug uh, discovery and translations and recipes and you name it. It will be able to do a lot of um, what we currently do. Um, so here's a, a diagram to explain the future landscape. So for a long time, humans were the only creators. Um, now we also have AI who are creators. Um, humans are going to continue to be creators, but we'll also have to play that important role of overseeing the AI, curating what they're doing, and the human oversight piece, which is humans as editors, as curators, and as tastemakers. Um, so a really important thing to realize is if you do want to be you know, a human creator, you should probably invest in artisanal crafts and things are, that are hard to replicate. Um, and because your throughput, the amount of products that you'll create won't be as many as, say, an AI generated AI and going to a, a you know, a mass market factory, uh, artisanal products will naturally, because of how rare they will be in the market, will be luxury pieces. Um, so this would be what I would encourage most creatives to do. Uh, this is Homo Faber. So Homo Faber, you can find ready existing artisans. Um, and I would encourage you to form the re these relationships with these artisans and really learn from them. Um, and shadow them and it will take a lot of patience I know a lot of young people now when I you know get rich quick kind of uh, fixes but actually the most important skills are the skills that take a while to learn and take you know thousands of hours to get to that level of mastery then we have AI for advertising um, so in this case, Coca-Cola actually worked with the creator community to come up with AI campaigns. Um, so first, they used all of their asset library to train an AI, and then creatives could go in there and prompt and create really cool campaigns. The, cam the winners were then showcased in Times Square. So this shows how big brands can start to work with the creative community, which is why I've also built creative communities like Fashion AI in order to um, build relationships between the creatives and these big fashion brands. Then we've got La La Land. Um, La La Land used, um, oh, sorry, Levi's used a tool called La La Land to create ads with these 3D AI models. And what they wanted to do with their campaign is to, um, to show as much diversity as possible. Unfortunately, they got a lot of backlash because people said, but why aren't you using real diverse models? Why can't you, you know, do that instead of using these AI models? So in some cases, these experimental brands that um, are the first to market to try these tools, often they do get backlash. Um, but, you know, some brands like to be in the headlines, so even bad, bad news can be good news. It really depends on, on where they, they sit um, on that from a sort of reputational standpoint. Um, one of the things that you can do with AI is take an image of, um, of a product and the image of the product needs to stay the same. Um, you do not want AI hallucinating and adding a sleeve to a dress. So that needs to stay consistent. But what you can do is you can create variation. So you can change the environment that it's in. So you can take a handbag and it can be sitting on a bed on one stage. It can be um, held by someone, another ad. And you can create all of these variations in the images um, with the backgrounds, but also with the models um, and the settings. And then you can use um, programmatic ads and you do A-B testing. So again, to use data to see what works. And often what works in one country or one city might not work in another place or for another um, different group of people, different personas. Um, so in order to get people to buy these products, we do need to personalize ads for them essentially. And here you can see um, an example with the sofa, it's creating different variations of this. And then those ads can go out and the data can sort of feedback and say, this is, this is the ad that works. 
and then that gets pushed out more. So more marketing spend goes on to that ad that works. Um, and next we've got working with influencers and celebrities. So things like deep fakes and AI influencers. So Eminem has tried to sue a number of different AI tools um, for using his voice. Um, and, and here's an example of um, a song uh, created in, with Eleven Labs. So the question is, if you were a celebrity today, would you be threatened by people taking your name, image, and likeness, which is what you look like, your voice, and creating these uh, sort of pastiche kind of songs or fan art that some people like to, to call it. It's fine if it's for entertainment, but when people start to commercialize um, these products, that's when it you are really infringing on, on copyright. And obviously if you were to take Eminem and to uh, put him in a campaign for sustainability or to support Trump, then you are also tampering with his reputation and who he is as a person. So um, that's one of the main Im issues with name, image and likeness that these celebrities like to protect. Um, and we've had in LA, we've had writer strikes, we now have actor strikes because of this. Um, on the flip side, we've got avatars. Um, or influencers. And a lot of influencers reach fame in their early teens, maybe in their 20s. And then suddenly, you know, they're getting married, they're having children, but they've got all of this following. Um, and they might not want to be like Madonna, who can consistently reinvents herself and has to be, you know, young and cool. Um, but they've created all this content. So why not create, uh, use that content to um, then power their own AI avatar? Or um, you have some creative uh, studios that have created AI avatars from scratch that have never existed. Um, this is an example of little Michaela. You're probably asking yourself, how is this robot talking to me right now? Did y'all hear about the robot invasion of 2020? I mean, I've been around for a minute, but I feel like last year was on a whole other level. If you're late to the party, hey, I'm Michaela. I'm a 19 year old robot living in LA making music and well, <laughs> I guess just keep watching and catch up. There's a reason why you're here. You belong. This is where dreams exceed expectations and where strangers become friends. So what's amazing about little Michaela is there are lots of people powering her. Um, so you have a model who does the photo shoots and then they turn her into little Michaela. You've got a singer or, or several singers um uh, and she's just like this this little demigod and she's going to remain 17 for the rest of of you know for decades um so for each subsequent uh generation um she will remain culturally relevant but again uh, remaining culturally relevant is quite difficult and there will be people who try and imitate who she is so um this is how easy it is actually to create a little Michaela yourself this is Lil Michaela. She's a 19-year-old Brazilian-American model, musical artist, and influencer with over a million Instagram followers. But she's not real. She's computer-generated. Lil Michaela was created by a Los Angeles-based startup called Bread, and they claim to specialize in artificial intelligence and robotics. We were wondering, though, if we could create our own little Michaela right here in the office. So we asked our motion graphics artist to whip her up on his computer, and he did in 48 hours, and she looks almost exactly like the real little Michaela. So here's how we did it. So I'm going to be using Fuse and Sema 40 to try to recreate Michaela. <laughs> continue to refine this make it look a little bit nicer but the ideas are all there now that you know the secret to creating your own little Michaela you can make a whole army of them you can put them on Instagram and see if anybody will notice the difference or you can do what we did which is put her in a cut tee really cool um and now this is 
metaphysic. Um, so metaphysic work with actors like Tom Hanks and Anne Hathaway, they will create a um, use photogrammetry, which is essentially where you photograph people's faces and each of those photographs are overlapping and they will do that in various different lighting conditions in uh, with like high dynamic range cameras. And then they can create this 3D model of their face. The face is the most important part and various different uh, people's expressions. Um, and I think what will happen in the future is actors will do this at different stages in their life so that when they are in their 60s, they can still do a film where they are rem reminiscing when they're in their early 20s and their first love and all of these sorts of things. And of course, then you can bring actors back to life. So this is an example of what they did at the X Factor. Thank you. Thank you very much. It sure is an honor to be here with you all on America's Got Time. Uh, I'd like to thank Tom, Chris, and Metaphysic for having me here tonight. I have to tell you, we're going to do a couple of our biggest records for you now. And this first one is a, a love song. And as a great philosopher once said, You ain't nothing but a hound boy. You ain't nothing but a hound boy. So you can see it's um a stunt double. Um, so there's a uh, a lot of potential in in that space. So if you are interested in that space, I would encourage you to learn tools like Blender, um, Unity, Unreal Engine. Uh, marvelous designer all of these 3d tools that have been used for uh, games which are now being used for films for ads um, and for entertainment um, so ai for for games and the metaverse um, you can use dali and ChatGBT to create games and the code for for creating these games um, making a game is incredibly expensive um, and also what um, researchers are doing at the moment is they are building games um, to simulate different scenarios. It's just showing you how easy it is to create a model. So you can um, create those 3D models, bring it into Blender um, and start to, to edit and, and play around with it. Um, and what, what researchers are currently doing is they're creating these generative agents. So they are essentially creating these AIs, giving them a personality, giving them a role, giving them a scenario of what they need to do. And they will put them into these 3D games and metaverse worlds and see how they behave socially or antisocially with one another because we are trying to understand AI and why it is um, responding to various prompts in specific ways. Um, AI is still quite unpredictable and the best way to observe how it's acting is to put it into these fake simulated environments of, of games and to watch how it's interacting. Um, so maybe this is also the future of films as well, where we can, you know, watch live as the film is is essentially um, happening. But of course, AI is not going to stick to the script. It's going to come up with its own variation of the, of that film, which could be equally as exciting and and unpredictable. So essentially, what happened here is they. Um, they started with a Smallville, which was a Sims-style game. Uh, they created 25 generative AI agent characters who lived in the game, um, and they operate in a way that resembles human behavior. The agents can 
plan a day, share any news, form relationships, coordinate activities. Um, next, the structure. How do you make uh, generative, AI, AI, generative agents? You need an architecture that stores and synthesizes and applies relative memories to generative believable behavior. This is done using a large language model, ChatGPT. There are three components. There's the memory system, a record of the agent's experiences. There's reflection that synthesizes memories to help draw conclusions. And there's planning, which translates the conclusions into actions and plans. So just as we're, we're trying to architect these agents to act like us, we're also learning about how, how we behave as humans, which is really fascinating. Um, and then we've got the story. So the simulation starts. One agent, Isabella, is instructed to organize a Valentine's Day party. A lot could go wrong. The agent could not act on the instruction, not remember to tell others, not remember to show up. And what happens? The result is a total of 12 agents heard about Isabella's party uh, by the end of the simulation. This was without any user intervention. What's more, the agent community formed new relationships during the simulation. The image shows the diffusion um, path for Isabella's party. And then there's emergent social behaviors. The agents autonomously spread invitations to the party over the next two days. Uh, they also made relationships, coordinated showing up on time, asked each other out on dates to the party. These behaviors were emergent versus pre-programmed. And the societal impact is there could be harmful consequences on society from generative AI agents. Anthropomorphism is humans attach emotions to the agents. This is what we'll see if we start to uh, incorporate these AI avatars, um, say, into dating and dating apps. Um, the impact of errors, a agents um, could make false dedu deductions and cause harm. Uh, and generative AI risk tailored persuasion and, and deep fakes. So we've already seen a lot of deep fakes um, being used in elections uh, with fake news. Fake news effectively derives from generative AI. Um, and we're going to see more and more realistic um, versions of that. And I think that's in with the younger generation, they're quite cynical about what they see online. Is this real? Is this not real? However, for our older generation, they may be more susceptible actually to believing what they see, um, which could be quite concerning when it comes to um, elections. But I digress. This is a, a talk about a uh, creativity. But the last thing to mention that being a creative also extends to building businesses and being innovative um, and understanding how to build innovative products, services, technologies um, to make money from your creativity, essentially. Um, and the creative process starts from strategy to insights, ideation, design, and then the go to market phase. Um, and there was one CEO that used ChatGBT to turn to come up with an idea, and he managed to turn this into um, 400 thousands worth of, of euros very quickly, just through AI generated designs on t-shirts. Um, and they are based in Portugal and they're called AI Aesthetic Apparel. So just to run through how this process could look and how easy it is. Um, so the first step is to ask ChatGPT to, to come up with some business ideas. So here is a prompt, which is um, essentially around um, limit and starting capital of 100 euros and the constraint that the entrepreneur can only work for one hour per week. What are some potential business ideas that they could do? And so ChatGBT then said, why not um, try being a social media management service, teaching online courses and tutoring or a print on demand store? So the person then decided on the print and demand store and then went to ChatGBT to come up with the brand and the tagline. So it came up with IntelliStyle, which is a combination of intelligence and style, AI aesthetic, aesthetic and AI, and Cogniware, cognitive and wear. 
They looked online, they looked on Shopify and Aesthetic had been taken already. Come up with some more ideas, they said. So came up with um, AI aesthetic apparel, AI aesthetic wear, AI aesthetic designs, and shop AI aesthetic. Um, and then the person said, okay, well, which would you choose, ChatGBT? Pick your favorite and explain why. And this is all about explainable AI, getting AI to explain why it's making certain decisions, and that can be really informative as well. Once you've decided on that, you can then create your uh, 10 task business plan. Obviously, this is oversimplifying um, how to set up a business, but it can be as easy as these 10 points. Um, and there are a number of other ways that you can use AI um, to act like you're a CMO at IKEA and to set up a partnership with two in, and come up with two innovative product ideas for each of the collaborations. So we see um, various different ideas between IKEA and Google, IKEA and Nike, IKEA and Apple, Spotify, Airbnb, et cetera. And then you can start to um, wireframe your ideas on a simple notepad, take a picture of it, and then the computer vision will then turn that into wireframes onto a website. So let's see this in action. So here you've got the actual code for it. And then here you have a very super, super simple website. Um, but it's it's fairly amazing. And um, again, this will improve um, very rapidly. So that's it from me. Some closing thoughts. Um, so how I like to work with brands is I like to help, help them rethink product development um, and to start to embed creative AI in, in their uh, workflows. I offer design sprints um, and create POC projects. And I do training for creatives internally. And, and that's it, that's me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening, everyone.